Okay, good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> At least we're a wee bit quicker than we have been the past few weeks. Yeah, my watch has been particularly slow over the past few weeks. Good to have you with us. If you're watching on YouTube, good to have you uh, joining with us today as well. Morning, Emphis. <laughs> I hate it when that kind of stuff happens, don't you? And everybody sees it. We're gonna um, we're gonna sing a, a song. Ten thousand reasons. As many of you know, Eunice and I were on holiday this week, and we were on an island. We were off of this island and on another island, uh, the island of Jersey, down in the Channel Islands, and a very uh, sheltered bay just off the coast of France, 11 miles off the, the coast of France. And one of the things that we experienced all week was the wonder of God's creation. As we travelled round the island and you go into little bays, you see the majesty of the, the colours, the blue sky, the green uh, water, the beautiful trees and flowers, the potato fields for the Jersey Royals. And that's what Eunice and I really just um, continually say to us, isn't God's creation amazing? And uh, that's what we're gonna sing this morning. We're gonna worship the Lord Jesus and all that he means to us. So if you're able to stand then, please stand with us as we sing this first song. <clears throat> Bless the Lord of my soul. 
Let's have a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you that we can come this afternoon and worship your holy name. We think on our time earlier today where we could think on Calvary and what the Lord Jesus did at the cross when he did it for the poor, wretched souls like us. Had it just been for the people in this room this afternoon, the Lord Jesus would still have come and would still have given his life as a sacrifice for our sin. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus and what he means for us. Father, bless Ian as he comes today to open your word and to, to preach from it. Father, we thank you for him, for his time spent in that place with you, seeking your face on what you would have him say today. Father, bless him as he opens the word later on. We ask that you'll be with us all. We think of those who are not here, those who are not too well, those who have some, some issues at home, Father. We just ask that you would bless them and be with them, we pray in your precious name. Amen. <clears throat> the video last week was talking about grace, and the video this week is talking about peace. And I quite like the name of the band who sing this song. They're called We the Kingdom. But I just think that's wonderful that we can be part of God's wonderful kingdom also when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus. I needed a holiday because prior to me going away last week, I was a grumpy so-and-so with a lot of people and I needed to get away. I needed to breathe some different air and uh, we set off last Monday back yesterday and I felt peace I felt not to be thinking about work or anything else and this song uh, just kind of delivers that it gives us some really nice words just to to wash over you and just think on the peace that you can gain from the Lord Jesus and what he can he can give to you so have a look at some of these words today and see what they can mean for you
a deep breath in and know that you are God. <clears throat> I really like that song. That's why I brought it to you this morning. <clears throat> this was one of the first songs we sang back as a church when we reopened after COVID and everything that, that had been locked down. And uh, the words never, never grow stale or grow old. Everyone needs compassion. A love that's never failing, let mercy fall on me. <coughs> let's, uh, let's see if we can stand and sing this one.
Yeah, I said we're very pleased to have Ian Jameson with us. This is his first time here, so don't feel nervous. We're all friends. And uh, we really ask that uh, that God would bless you this afternoon. Let's just, let's just have a prayer and just commend ourselves before God. Father, we thank you that we can sing these songs this afternoon. Everyone needs compassion. I will worship. But that last one there at the end, Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed and renewed. And Father, we need that renewing of your Holy Spirit every day in our lives. Father, we just ask that you would help us to, to remember that. Bless Ian as he would come up now. Encourage him. Give him power and authority to, to preach your words this afternoon, Father. And we ask that you would bless him as he does so. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see you, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and to open the Word of God with you this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who've not met me, which is most of you, my name is Ian Jameson. I'm married to uh, Rebecca Hutton, um, who some of you will know, uh, who grew up in this area, and we moved back to Renfrewshire in December of last year. I'm an Inverness boy, but um, it's lovely to, to live here now. We live in Erskine, and we're in Fellowship at Albert Hall in Renfrew, so we bring you the greetings of all the Lord's people there uh, today. I'd like to ask you to turn, please, in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. To the Gospel of Mark and to chapter 2, please. The Gospel of Mark in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to have a short reading from uh, this chapter. We're going to read from verse 13 to verse 17. Some well-known verses. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. But before we do that, let me just come before the Lord again briefly in prayer. Almighty God and dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and honour of worshipping you today. We thank you, Lord, that we've been able to remember your son in the way that he's asked us to. And then now we have the responsibility and privilege of preaching your word. And we thank you, Father, for your son, the Lord Jesus. We pray that he would be the preoccupation of our hearts and of our minds this afternoon. We pray that the Holy Spirit himself would be our teacher, that he would take hold of the word of God and apply it to our hearts. We particularly pray today for anybody here in this room today who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal saviour or anybody who might watch this video in the future, Lord, we pray that they would understand that they are a sinner in need of a saviour and that there is only the one saviour from sin that you have provided in your love and his name is Jesus Christ. For those of us here who know and love him, we thank you for him, for every spiritual blessing in heavenly places that we have through him. We pray now that as we read your word, Father, you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit and that we would have open eyes and ears to listen and perceive, and we'd have ready hands and feet to put it into practice. We ask these things in complete dependence upon you, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So it's Mark chapter 2 then that we're going to focus on uh, this afternoon, and I want to look at it under sort of two headings, but before we get there, let me just say something about the Gospel of Mark more widely. It's a Gospel, of course, which is full of questions. It's a gospel is full of questions from beginning to end, asked by different people in different ways at different times. But there is one question that runs all of the way through the gospel of Mark from beginning to end. And that is this absolutely central question. In fact, the most important question you could be asked. And that is, who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Christ. And that question is asked time and time again through the Gospel of Mark. What is his identity? Where has he come from? Who really is this man, Jesus of Nazareth? And I want to begin this afternoon, friends, by asking you a very personal question. Now, I've not met hardly any of you at all before, so please forgive me asking you a very personal question, but I don't want a, an answer out loud. Just answer it in the quietness of your heart. If I was to ask you today, as you sit here in Bethany in Paisley today, who is Jesus Christ to you? Who do you believe him to be? If I was to give you a piece of paper and a pen right here, right now, and ask you to write down for me what you believe about Jesus, who do you believe him to be? What would you write down? Some of you might say, well, Ian, one piece of paper isn't enough. 
and one pen isn't enough because he means everything to me. I can't imagine life without him. He's come to be my savior, my master, my deliverer, my healer, my friend, my redeemer, everything. And I can't imagine living life without Jesus Christ. And I hope that that's the case for some of you here this morning, this afternoon rather, that Jesus Christ has come to mean absolutely everything to you. There might be those here this afternoon who would say, well, I'm just not quite sure. I'm just not quite sure what I'd write down. I don't know a great deal about Jesus yet. Well, you're in the right place to find out more. And there might be people here this afternoon who would say, well, you know, at one time I would have spoken like that. At one time I would have said he meant everything to me, but today I'm just not quite so sure where I stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want you to keep thinking about that question and we'll perhaps come back to it later as we consider these verses in Mark's gospel. But Mark begins with an answer. I've said that it's all about questions and it is, but it begins with an answer to this question, who is Jesus? There are in fact seven testimonies to the identity of the Lord Jesus in Mark chapter one. We're not gonna go into them in any great detail, but let me just point them out to you. The first is the testimony of the author himself, Mark. Look with me at Mark chapter one and verse one. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Before Rebecca and I got married, I lived and worked in London. And uh, on a Wednesday after work, I, I worked in central London. And on a Wednesday after work, I used to stand outside Green Park Tube Station just for an hour or so. And I would give out gospels of Mark. And uh, somebody once asked me, why do you give out gospels of Mark rather than uh, maybe gospels of John? And I said, well, for me, you see, when I'm giving out a gospel, I know, especially in a city like London, that maybe one in 10, maybe one in 20, maybe one in 100 will actually read that gospel. But they may read the first couple of verses. And John's gospel begins, of course, with in the beginning was the word, wonderful verses, but maybe uh, not easily understood by the average non-Christian in Britain today. Luke begins with an account of why he's written the gospel, and Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus, which I maybe would give to Jewish people who would understand that genealogy, but Mark begins in this wonderfully simple, concise way. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and if the person I give that gospel to only reads that verse, then they've read something very worthwhile reading in the beginning. So this is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the true and living God. So that's the testimony of the author. And then he goes to the testimony of Isaiah the prophet. And he roots us right at the beginning in the fact that this one is the promised and prophesied one of the Old Testament. And then we have the testimony of the Holy Spirit as the Lord Jesus is baptized by John. And the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove. And then we have the testimony of the Father. The testimony of the Father, verse 11. You are my beloved Son with you. I am well pleased. And then we have the testimony, interestingly, of the demons. The demons. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's the voice of demons. And then lastly, the last testimony in chapter one is the testimony of the leper who goes and makes the Lord known in his area because of what the Lord has done in cleansing him. But not until we get into Mark chapter 2 do we begin to hear about Jesus himself speaking of his own identity. And so at this point then I want to come back to the question I asked, who do you believe Jesus Christ to be? Well in Mark chapter 2 the Lord begins to speak, to him, speak about himself as the son of man, as the physician, as the bridegroom, as Lord of the Sabbath. Four very interesting titles, but we're only going to look at one of those uh, this afternoon, and we're only going to touch on it briefly. So I want to look then at these verses, verse 13 to 17, and I want to look at it under two headings. First of all, I want to see a sinner, a sinner who was called by the Savior, a sinner who was called by the Savior. And then secondly, I want to look at this Savior who keeps company with sinners, this Savior who keeps company with sinners. So let's read verses 13 and 14. And here we're encountering this sinner who met the Savior. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And he rose and followed him. Very simple reading from God's word, brothers and sisters, but very rich in truth. 
So I want to look at this sinner who was called by the Saviour. Here was a man who had a very ordinary life. Now, when I worked in London, I worked, I wasn't a civil servant, but I worked alongside a lot of civil servants. And I would go in on the underground every day from East London, and I'd be surrounded by civil servants. They go in to London, and they go out again to the suburbs where they live. They have orderly lives. They have ordinary sort of lives. They go in, they know what time they start work, they know what time they finish work, and they go home again. That was the sort of life that this man had. He was a civil servant. He was a tax collector. But there was another element to his life, of course, too, which was that tax collectors were despised. We all know this. We're familiar with this. Or perhaps most of us are despised because they were sellouts to the Roman authorities. The Romans had, of course, conquered uh, Palestine and they needed people amongst the population to act as civil servants. And those who saw a financial opportunity and didn't care much about their neighbours volunteered to be tax collectors. And of course, you can imagine how hated they were. So here was this man with, on the one hand, a very ordinary life, a very orderly life, and on the other hand, a difficult life because he'd burnt many bridges. But his life was about to change in one day. About to change in one day. And if you're here this afternoon and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal saviour, if you've been born again by the Holy Spirit of God, then you'll be able to look back to a day that changed your life forever. A day that changed your life forever. Now, of course, there are those like myself who are saved at a young age and perhaps it's more gradual. I'm not saying you have to look back and see a particular minute of a particular day. But there's a day when you encounter the Lord Jesus and you're changed forever. Can I ask you, is that you? Is that you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? So here was a man whose life changed. He was going to that day respond to an invitation that would mean that he would see thousands fed with a few loaves and a few fish, that he would see his friend walking on water, that he would see the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. His life was going to change in one day. And his life was changed by two words. Two words. Do you know that two words can change your life? Perhaps there are those here who have been in a, a doctor's waiting room. And they're waiting for just a couple of words. And what those words are will change the rest of their life. Or perhaps you have had the experience of somebody saying to you those Three words, will you, four words, will you marry me? Will you marry me? And then the word that you get in reply, either yes or no, will change the rest of your life forever. This man's life was changed by two words. Now, I know it's a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon rather, and I don't want to complicate things, but I, I'll do a little bit of grammar here. There was a verb and a pronoun. A verb and a pronoun. Follow, there's the verb, me. There's the pronoun. Follow me. Let's look at them closely. See, the Lord says to this man, follow me. He says, follow. What does it mean to follow? Well, to follow means to go in the direction that somebody is going. It means to recognize a certain degree of authority in that person. There are many people out there in the world today that would like you and me to be their followers because they want us to recognize their authority. They want us to give them some sort of position of status and yet the question is, who are we following? You see, the Bible actually tells me that everybody in Paisley is a follower today. Everybody in Paisley is a follower. Now, Bethany Evangelical Church is called that because they want other people in Paisley to become Christians, because they want to make the gospel known in Paisley. So that must mean that not everybody in Paisley, sadly, is a follower of Jesus Christ. We know that to be true. We know that to be true. It would be a very different place, wouldn't it? Renfrew would be a very different place. Erskine, where I live, would be a very different place if everybody was a follower of Jesus Christ, but they're sadly not. And our heart breaks for them. And the whole thrust of our witness as local churches is to that gospel that saves. There is only one gospel that saves. And we want to make it known. We desperately want to make it known to those who will go to hell if they do not believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Follow, he says. So we're all followers. Let me read to you from uh, Ephesians and chapter 2. It says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And then we have those wonderful verses, but God, 
being rich in mercy. And we have the intervention of God, which means that every Christian in this room today can claim that they are no longer children of wrath, but they've been made children of God through the grace that's in Christ Jesus. So yes, we're all followers. Everybody in Paisley is a follower. But the question is who? You see, it's good to have the verb. It's good to be a follower. But we must have the pronoun too. We must follow him and him alone. Following implies a destination. Following implies a destination. You see, I could ask you to follow me to Inverness where I come from. And we would share the same destination. But I also ask you to follow me in the mode in which I go. Remember the, the schoolyard game, follow my leader, where you have to do the same as the person in front of you. So those two elements are there in following. What about Levi's response? He receives a very simple invitation, follow me. What's his response? Look back to the verses in Mark's gospel, and we see here a very simple response, and he rose and followed him. And he rose and followed him a very simple response to a simple invitation he rose which means that he recognized a change had to take place in his life a change had to take place if he was ever going to follow the lord jesus he would have to rise from the tax booth and he'd have to leave that all behind you know it's impossible to begin a new life with jesus christ and to take all of your old sin into that new life the bible doesn't paint that picture of untransformed Christian lives. Now, of course, we all fail and we all fall. We sung about that earlier with all my fears and failings. And all of us here this morning who are believers would recognize, we'd be the first to put our hand up and say, we fail every day and let the Lord down in one way or another. And yet he has given us, hasn't he, brothers and sisters, new life in the Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit has come to live within and he gives us power, power to live a transformed life following the Lord Jesus Christ. So he rose, and then he followed. He followed. He did what the Lord asked of him, and he followed him. A transfer of allegiance, a transformation of goals and desires. Now, we've all been called to walk a narrow road together, and I don't know you and you don't know me, but we're walking, if we're believers, we're walking the same narrow road. And I don't know how you're getting on on your walk on the narrow road. But there may be some people here today who would say, you know, they can look back behind them and they can see the road behind them. And as it were, they can see real concrete progress. And they can look behind them and say, you know, there are things I used to love. There are things that used to fill my mind. And now God has replaced those things with new loves and new desires and new passions for him and for his word and for prayer and for his people. And you can see real spiritual progress. And I hope and pray that that's you today. And if it is, then hallelujah, that's wonderful. But there might be Christians here today who would say, you know, Ian, if I'm really honest with you, if I'm really honest with you, sometimes it feels on this narrow road that I take one step forward and I take three steps back. Sometimes it feels as though every time there's a stone, I stumble on it. And every time there's a B road or a by road, I end up going down it and get distracted. But you know, brothers and sisters, the wonderful thing about the narrow road is this, that whether you're in category A, rejoicing in your progress, or you're in category B, feeling a bit downhearted, or maybe somewhere in between, which is probably most of us, the destination is guaranteed. The destination of that road is guaranteed. Why? Because it doesn't depend on your performance. And it doesn't depend upon my performance. It depends upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. He has paid the price in full. He has secured our redemption. And so the destination is absolutely secure. So he rose and he followed I want to ask you another question. If you were to understand today that there is only one saviour from sin, Jesus Christ, and that you are a sinner, and that you've done and said and thought things that are wrong, and that therefore you're separated from a holy God, and there is a way back to God from the dark paths of sin, there's a door that's open, and you may go in at Calvary's cross. It's where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. If you were to recognise that today, Would you be willing to respond to the invitation of the Lord Jesus? Because, do you know, 2,000 years have passed, but he is still making that invitation today. Why? Because he's alive. Because he's alive. Every Christian here believes that with all their heart. That Jesus Christ did not stay in the grave, but rose victorious over death and sin and hell and is today still making that invitation to men and women, boys and girls in Paisley today and still transforming lives. Isn't it amazing to think, brothers and sisters, 
that the gospel of the Lord Jesus is being preached today all over the world. All over the world. He's being preached in Argentina and Nigeria and Thailand and Japan and he's being preached here in the UK. And today there will be people who woke up this morning as sinners bound for hell with no hope in the world. And tonight they'll go to sleep as saved saints knowing the Lord Jesus on their way to heaven. Isn't that amazing? There will be people who get saved today. I wonder if that will be you. I wonder if anybody in Paisley today, in any of the churches where the gospel is preached, I wonder if anybody in Paisley will respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ today. So can I ask you, have you responded to that message of the gospel? But there's a second little part to our passage this morning. It wasn't just this sinner who was called by the Savior. It was this Savior who keeps company with sinners because the Pharisees are watching what Jesus is doing like a hawk all the time, trying to trip him up and to entrap him. And they have a serious question for him. And I want us to take that question seriously. So go down to verse 16. And I'll read from verse 15, actually, just for the sake of context. It says this, As he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now just imagine this for a moment, brothers and sisters. You are seeing in a room the one who claims to be the son of the true and living God, God himself, perfect in purity, holiness, spotless, and he is surrounded by people you wouldn't be seen dead with. Surrounded by them. And the Pharisees there are full of their own righteousness, full of their own holiness, and they're watching this scene and they see an utter contrast between this one who says he is the son of the true and living God, and they're, of course, highly skeptical about that claim, and they see it as completely, completely incongruous that he should be surrounded by all these people that they wouldn't spend the time of day with. They would cross the street to avoid people like this, so why is Jesus surrounded by them? We need to take this question seriously. Now, I'm not going to do a whole survey of the Bible. Um, my um, friends in my own assembly make fun of me and they say, Ian, whatever you're speaking on, you always read something from Genesis and something from Revelation. Um, and I think I don't make an apology for that because the Bible is one wonderful story, isn't it? From beginning to end, this book is a wonderful story of God's redemption. And it's like a beautiful, well-oiled machine where every cog plays its role just perfectly. And if you were to remove that cog, the machine would cease to function. Well... Let me take you back to the book of Exodus, to the book of Exodus and chapter 24. The book of Exodus and chapter 24. You see, we go right back to the beginning and we remember what it was that happened when sin entered the world. What was it that happened when sin entered the world? It was that Eve, first of all, and then Adam, took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They took that fruit and what did they do with it? They ate it. They ate it. Eating right at the heart of the problem of sin. Now, you might say, Ian, that's immaterial. It doesn't really matter what happened. It mattered that there was rebellion against the heart of God. There was rebellion against the rules that God had given, that the commandments that God had established. And that's true. That's true. But nonetheless, it was eating, eating the forbidden fruit. And then we fast forward to Exodus chapter 24, and God is beginning his rescue mission through this unique nation, the, na the nation of Israel, the Jews. A unique nation that remained unique today and will do so in the future. God has plans and purposes for them. And he is establishing his relationship with Israel. They're going to be like a picture book of redemption to the rest of the world. And he meets with them on Mount Sinai. And I love these verses. I think they're absolutely fascinating. Let me just read them to you. Verse 9 of Exodus 24. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up. And listen carefully to this. And they saw the God of Israel. That's a fascinating statement. We're told elsewhere in the New Testament that no man has seen God at any time. But only the Son of God has made him known. So who did they see there upon the mountain? I firmly believe it was the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God himself. They saw the God of Israel. And then listen, there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone. Like the very heaven for clearness. Imagine that. We can't get our heads around that. A pavement of sapphire stone. And then this. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. They ate and drank on the mountain in front of God. What a strange thing to do. 
It's a strange time for a picnic, isn't it? Up there on Mount Sinai. When God himself is right there in front of you, you would expect that you would just get down on your knees and worship him. And yet they ate and drank on the mountain. Why? Why? Because there's something in eating and drinking that speaks of restored fellowship. Restored fellowship. God was beginning a rescue mission through the Jewish nation and he gives an indication here in this eating and drinking with mankind that reconciliation is beginning. That the way back to God is beginning. And it's going to be through this Jewish nation and of course through the Messiah that will come through this Jewish nation. We're all like that with eating and drinking. We, we don't invite round to our house for a meal people that we don't want to spend time with. And normally we choose to eat with those that we want to have some sort of fellowship with. It doesn't matter whether you're a primary school child going to school for the first day or you're an older person going to a new job. One of the things that will go through your mind, no matter what stage of life you're at, is who am I going to sit with at lunch? Who am I going to sit with at lunch? Now, of course, that might weigh more heavily on the mind of a primary school uh, pupil. But even adults care about that sort of thing. Who's going to sit with me at lunchtime? Why? Because eating and drinking together always speaks of fellowship. Now, if we were to zoom forward in the Bible to the upper room, the Lord Jesus Christ was giving his disciples a very simple way of remembering him. And I gather that before this service, uh, you met as we did at Albert Hall to eat and to drink in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. This is something that the Lord has asked us to do, and it's so important that we do it, to take the bread and take the wine to remember him. So he's given us eating and drinking as a way of showing forth his death until he comes, until he comes. Well, there's coming a day and we're going to eat and drink in his presence. And uh, let me turn you to Revelation and chapter 19, Revelation and chapter 19. And it says this in uh, verse, verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And then listen to verse 9 particularly. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's coming a day when we will eat and drink in the presence of God himself. And there'll be no sin to spoil the picture. Every Christian here today would recognize and realize and admit today that even when we meet together to break bread and drink wine, we are so aware of our sin. We are so aware of all that's in our life that isn't right. And yet there's coming a day when we'll sit down with God on high and all sin will be gone. All sin will be gone. Isn't it amazing to think, friends, we're going to see him one day. The Bible teaches very clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ could come at any moment. There's absolutely no guarantee that I'll finish this message today before we see the Lord Jesus face to face. He comes to take us home. Well, that's our little tour through the scriptures of eating and drinking. It speaks of restored fellowship. So how would we answer their question? If I take you back to Mark's gospel, and we see this question from the, the, the Pharisees. They say this, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners, we could, answer, we could answer them like this. You know, men, if you can't cope, if you can't cope with Jesus of Nazareth eating and drinking with some tax collectors and sinners, just you wait. Just you wait, because there's coming a day when millions upon millions upon millions of people who've done things infinitely worse than these people will also sit with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And if you don't recognize who Jesus Christ is, you'll miss out on it. These very Pharisees who thought they were so well educated in the scriptures and so informed about the things of God will miss out on the banquet that these tax collectors and sinners that they despised will be there for. And if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, praise God, you'll be there too. You'll be there too. I don't know you. I don't know your past. I don't know the sort of things you may have done and said and thought. And thank goodness you don't know the sort of things I've done and said and thought in my life. And God, the God of heaven, knows all of it. He knows all the intricate details of every failure, every mistake I've ever made. And yet, beyond that, despite that, he has paid the price for me in the sending of his son to the cross of Calvary. Isn't it wonderful? 
Wonderful to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask you again, do you know him? Is he your personal savior? How will you respond? Will you do what this man did? Will you rise and follow? Would you be prepared to leave your old life behind? Would you be prepared to come with your sin and give it to Jesus and accept his salvation? The Lord is still making the invitation to come to him. Will you come to him today? There's an invitation I just want to finish with in the book of Revelation, earlier in the book of Revelation. And it's a wonderful invitation that's been preached on many times. And its primary application is to Christians. But I believe it's a verse that can be used speaking to those who don't know Christ. And it says this. It's the words of the Lord. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. And then what does he say? And eat with him. And he with me. Restored fellowship. That's what the Lord wants for you. Lord God Almighty wants to have a living relationship with you. Because he loves you. So he stands at the door. And he knocks. And the question is, will you open the door? And respond to him? Will you rise and follow and accept him as your personal Lord and Saviour. Let's pray together. Almighty God and dear Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he left the glory of heaven and came all the way down to this sin-stained earth. We thank you that he did miracles. We thank you that he provided teaching, but we thank you most of all that he went to the cross of Calvary and died there to pay the price for sin. Lord, it's our heart's cry today that the people of Paisley would realize that they need a savior from sin and trust in the Lord Jesus. Oh Lord, we long for you to move in this town and in this district and in this part of Scotland, Renfrewshire. We pray that you would move by your Holy Spirit that we might see men and women, boys and girls coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that if there's anybody here today who doesn't know the savior, that they would accept him, that they would respond to the invitation that your son is still issuing, follow me and lord we pray for those of us who do know you that we would enjoy this restored fellowship with you and that we would have the privilege of inviting others to follow your son the lord jesus so we pray for this church here we thank you for bethany and for all the believers here and we pray for your richest blessing upon it and its testimony in the days ahead and we ask for a parting blessing now in jesus precious name amen <laughs>